Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program and, and welcome to the kickoff for NYC by Design. Uh, so we're really uh, happy to have everyone here to celebrate Architecture Day with us. Um, before we dive in, as people are continuing to join, I just wanted to go over a few uh, housekeeping things. Um, so first of all, my name is Andrew Gustafson. Uh, I'm from Turnstile Tours. Um, I see a lot of familiar names, but if you're new to us, um, we uh, are a tour company that leads tours in partnership with nonprofit and community organizations. And for the last 13 years, uh, we've had the privilege to lead the tours of the Brooklyn Navy Yard in partnership uh, with the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Uh, and so over the last year, we haven't been able to give in-person tours at the yard or most of the other sites where we work, um, but uh, we have had the pleasure to be able to uh, work with the yard to do a, a whole series of, of virtual programs uh, about its past, present, and future. Uh, and today we're going to talk about all three of those things, uh, looking at, at one specific uh, project. Um, so in just a couple of minutes, we're going to bring in our special Special guest and our, our live tour uh, of Building 127. Um, a couple other things just to keep in mind, you know, in the virtual space, we try and be as interactive as, as we are in uh, giving live in-person tours, and we do that through the chat. Uh, so please drop your questions into the chat, and behind the scenes uh, is my colleague Cindy, uh, who will be uh, answering questions and also passing them on to our guests um, Rosario. Um, so feel free to, to drop them in there. Uh, we also have closed captioning available. Um, so you can turn that on or off at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're joining us uh, from a, a, a smartphone or a tablet, uh, you just go into the settings uh, and you can turn them uh, on or off, uh, whatever you would like. Um, we also have a number of programs coming up um, as part of NYC by Design Week, as well as other programs as well. So I just wanted to share those um, because this will not, not be our last visit this week to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so uh, our next program is actually later this afternoon uh, where we're gonna be uh, going down to Bush Terminal uh, in Sunset Park and taking a look at the Made in New York campus. There will also be a live uh, live tour um, of a very active construction site. And then on Sunday, we're uh, going back to the Navy Yard uh, to take a look at Bednark Studio, which is a design build firm uh, in the yard. And we'll, we're going to get a walkthrough of their really amazing space and the incredible facilities and equipment that they have um, with, uh, with the, the owner, uh, Michael Bednark. Um, we also are continuing our ongoing series of virtual programs that explore a wide variety of topic, topics. Um, so you can, if you want to learn about uh, Thai food as a way to celebrate uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, we're doing a whole series of those every Wednesday morning. Uh, so join our next one on uh, Wednesday, May 19th. Um, we also have a whole series of waterfront related programs that aren't just about the Navy Yard. Uh, so on May 20th, we're going to be looking at the history of canals along the Connecticut River. Uh, we did, we've done the Morris Canal and the Delaware and Raritan Canal and the Erie Canal. So now we're going to look at Connecticut River Canals. Um, and then on the 22nd, for folks who like uh, maritime and waterfront topics, uh, we're going to be doing a special trivia night uh, for National Maritime Day um, and then continuing our, our, our Thai foods uh, in, in America series. We also have live uh, we do have some in-person tours. So uh, this Saturday, we're doing a tour of Prospect Park and uh, we have them every weekend. So you can check out our website and view the calendar. Uh, and then coming very soon, uh, within the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be launching, uh, relaunching a bicycle tours of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So stay tuned, sign up for our newsletter um, and uh, you can, we're, we're still doing limited capacity, socially distanced tours. Um, so be sure to uh, to sign up for those because I'm sure they're going to sell it very, very quickly. Um, and I should just say that uh, all of this programming is made possible through our partners uh, like the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation uh, for supporting this program, but also through our members. And I know we have a number of Turnstile members who are with us today. So if you want to continue to support our work uh, and get access to our archive of over 200 uh, past virtual programs, um, you can sign up for our membership. Okay, 
Um, great. So that is all the housekeeping stuff and our upcoming programs. Um, and so now I want to uh, welcome our guests. So we're going to be joined by uh, Senior Project Manager at the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, uh, Rosario Durso, who oversaw uh, this uh, project of renovating um, Building 127, which is really one of the last major renovation projects uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so uh, he's going to join us uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a moment, um, give us an overview of uh, the building and the project. Then we're going to go inside and take a look at the amazing renovation work and how this building was, was totally uh, transformed. Um, so I see Rosario on our screen. So uh, we'll put the spotlight on him uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, explore the building a little bit. Hi, Rosario. How are you doing? Hi, Andrew. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, give a note to folks. Uh, when we go inside, um, Cell reception is always a little spotty in the Navy Yard. We tested it out and it should be fine. But if you lose us for a, a second or two, just, just bear with us because um, there are just a couple dead spots in the building. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about where you're standing, Rosario. Hi, Andrew. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. So first of all, thank you so much for signing up to this tour of Building 127 at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's a pleasure for me to be your host, and I hope you're going to enjoy the project that we'll go over shortly. Today, we are pres I'll present to you Building 127, which is the building that we have right behind us. The rehabilitation project concluded, started in 2018 and ended in 2020, last year. As we will see shortly, Building 127 is really a, a building of many lives. And certainly the project that we just finished uh, is not gonna be the last one inside the building and definitely wasn't the first one. Without further ado, and thanks for Andrew for, for starting introducing me, but I wanted to introduce you to the team and myself again. Again, my name is Rosario Durs and I work for the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Uh, the years between 2018 and 2020 have been very busy for me as I spent the majority of my time inside of this, this, this building here. Uh, and so yes, the project was completed in 2020. As all successful projects, this project was successful because it was the uh, collaboration of several entities working all together com towards a common goal. I'm just one of the many that worked on the project and I will never thank enough uh, all the talented teams that worked together in helping us out, finishing up on time at the project. A special thanks I have to say, and Andrew, if you could go to slide two, please. A special thanks to all the design team led by S9 Architecture, who did a fantastic job. Without them, JFKM, Seelman, Higgins, uh, being available at any time of the day, trying to figure out various construction details on the spot, uh, we will not be here. Or well, probably we will be here, but maybe in 2024 and not in 2020 as we finished in 2021. Obviously, thanks to the construction team led by Turner Construction, and thanks to all the various entities that believed on the project and saw the potential at the beginning and gave us funding, resources, and their expertise. Lastly, I obviously wanted to introduce you to the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. And Andrew, if you could go to slide three. I will leave behind uh, uh, the history of the yard, which is a fascinating history. I'm going to let Andrew chime in and give you a good overview of the history of the yard. I can just invite you to come here, go to the museum that we have a Building 92, or reach out to Turnstiles uh, to have a tour of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. When I joined, that was the first time, the first thing that I did, it was extremely helpful for me to understand what the Brooklyn Navy Yard was and what the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is now. And that is my focus that I wanted to, to give you an overview of. The Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation is a non-profit corporation that serves as the developer and the manager for the city-owned land where we are now. We are a mission-driven organization dedicated really to bring manufacturing uh, jobs, quality manufacturing jobs inside the yard and here in Brooklyn, here in New York City. That is our main mission. And uh, the land that we are managing and developing is about 300 acres. Just to give you an idea, 
is half of the size of Prospect Park. And Prospect Park is the second biggest park uh, in, in New York City. So it's a, it's a big chunk of land. Um, if you can, Andrew, if you could go to slide four. The yard, as I said, is 300 acres in area. We have 400 businesses, about 10,000 uh, uh, people working here every day. And if you can jump to slide five now. In the last decade, following our mission to bring manufacturing jobs inside the, inside the Brooklyn Yard and Brooklyn and New York City, and following our vision for our new master plan, we undertook major adaptive reuse projects that you can see in the slide that you have on the screen. There are many to talk about from Steiner to New Lab, to Wegmans, and now, if you can see in the screen, you see the blue dot, there is also Building 127 that we can add to our portfolio. What we see here is ju are just a few projects that we recently completed. And me as an architect, I'm an I'm, 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 I'm uh, architect by trade, is, a, is an honor and a pleasure to work here. So let's start our tour. Let's go for a moment, Andrew, to slide six, if you, if you don't mind. As you can see, building 127, you should be able now to see the map of the yard. Is, uh, the building 127 is started in the southwest corner of the yard. Precisely, and Andrew, if you get, can go to slide seven. Building 127 is an existing historical three-story manufacturing building located at the corner of Morris Avenue and Third Street. The size of the building is about 300 by 100 feet in plan. The building was originally built in 1903 by the, by the Navy Yard, sorry, by the US Navy. Um, the new US Navy then used the building until 1966 when they left the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The building was under, uh, it has been abandoned for a certain period of time until 1981 when we gave it to Cumberland uh, Sugar Packing, who stayed inside the building until 2016. So yes, Cumberland was packaging sugar inside this building. So come with me now a bit closer to the building so we can start looking at the elevations of the building. Today is an amazing day, which is really helping out our tour. I want to show you now and if you can go to slide eight, and then if you can, a few seconds to slide nine. I want to start now to show you how the building is now and how it was previously back in 2018. You immediately understand that there is something missing here. We, uh, well, we didn't have windows. Um, so for some reason around the, first part of the 20th century, we don't know exactly when, the Navy Yard, sorry, the Navy Yard, the US Navy uh, decided to cover up all the openings of the windows. It's definitely, especially for a manufacturing building, it's definitely much easier to uh, uh, cover up a leaky old wooden window rather than repair it and keep it uh, in, good, uh, in, good, in, in, in good condition. So in the early, in the first part of the 20th century, the building was completely covered up. So our first challenge, you can see it right away, was really to recreate the openings that were there originally in 1903. The building was originally designed for uh, the repair of ships, since they, again, the Navy Yard was under the US Navy control. Uh, so luckily in 2000, sorry, yes, in 2018, when we went, uh, when we took over and we started the renovation, luckily we found out that the lintel of the windows were still there, the openings were still in good condition, and it was just a matter, very difficult task, but just a matter of removing very carefully all the CMU blocks to recreate the, the openings and then reinstall new windows. And Doug, uh, maybe we can pan back a little bit so we can uh, take a look at the building and some of those, those sure. windows.
Uh, we just want to watch your finger. But yeah, if we can see the, especially the circular window up at the top is beautiful. Yes, the circular window was definitely challenging. That is the only window in here, here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the project. All the other windows are wood. And I can tell you that there are very few manufacturers able to build uh, windows that are sometimes 17 feet tall by 12 feet wide. They are massive windows. Only the installation took uh, a lot of uh, logistics and a lot, lot of thinking. Now guys, uh, come with us. Let's go inside the building. Let's go to inside the building, uh, the, the first floor. So this is our lobby. We'll talk about it later on, but our, our intervention was minimal. So the lobby is ready now to undergo through a new project, a new renovation where we'll embellish it and make it more pleasant for our tenants. Doug, I wanted to go over, go in the center if it's possible. Andrew, if you go to slide 10, you should be able at this point to see the floor plan of the ground floor, just to give you an idea where we are at now. You can immediately see the super high ceiling height. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful space and is a manufacturing space. It's ready, you can start seeing ladders, uh, uh, cement uh, bags, uh, a lift here. It's ready again for the new phase. In fact, we recently released the space to Daedalus Design and Production, a scenery fabrication and production company established here in New York City. And this space is perfect for them and for any installation and any scenery space that they need to design and fabricate here. Uh, if they want to do so, obviously they should take advantage of the high ceiling. If they want, uh, they can also build uh, some mezzanines or leave it as is. Image, uh, and Doug, if you can go to slide 11 and then slide 12 after a few seconds. Image that here we had ships coming in and out of the building for the first part of the 20th century. Right here on my right, uh, there were trucks uh, that were leading to that uh, big uh, open in storefront where ships were coming in and out inside the building so that they could be repaired. We had these massive openings that are shown, I think, on slide 12 that we are here, that we see here as integrated in the building. As you can see here, the intervention that we undertook was, uh, is minimal. We didn't want to change the um, uh, uh, nature of the building. And this is for two reasons. The first reason is because building 127 is actually within the Brooklyn Navy Yard historical district. Building 127, in fact, is a structure that is recorded into the uh, NPS, uh, New York State Office and Park of Recreation uh, in Historic Preservation Registry. So it's a, an historic building that we had to uh, protect and make sure that our interve intervention was respectful to the nature of the building as it was built in 1903. But secondly, from a business, perhaps a business point of view, when we started the project, we didn't know what tenant was gonna be inside the building. So we wanted to keep the um, uh, intervention minimal so that the, any tenant could see the space, could see the potential, and then continue the design, creating their fit out space. What I find uh, fascinating about this floor is what we called the annex. And I wanted to take you over there just to take, take a look uh, real quick. I still remember the first time that I saw this space and I, could, I, I immediately thought, okay, this is, can happen only in New York City. So what we call the annex, which is now an integral part of the building, is
We just lost you for a second, so just bear with us, folks. Um, we'll have them back in just a second. It looks like uh, we hit a we hit a dead spot in the um, uh, in the annex, um, but that's okay. Uh, someone asked if we could uh, take a look at at some of these historical photos again, um, and they will be back with us in in just just a moment. Um, so yeah, a little bit about the uh, historical images um, that Rosario was was talking to, to us about, and so I just want to explain a little bit about the the history of the building, um, because. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually what the building was intended to be used for, which is the construction of um, like lifeboats and launches um, for much, much larger ships. So this was actually a wooden boat building shop. Um, and so those are the types of vessels that you see in this uh, in this image here. Um, and so what I really love about this building, um, since Rosario was talking about how the, we have this connection, you know, between the history um, and the, you know, manufacturing that we're continuing to support today at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, is that, you know, we, we had this long tradition at the yard of, of, of wooden boat building. Um, even long after the end of the age of, uh, of wood and sail, uh, we continued to employ people uh, working in those crafts of wooden boat building, specifically for the construction of, of these lifeboats uh, and launches. Um, and so that's what the building was originally built for um, back in, in 1904. Um, but as Rosario said, over time, um, the use of the building changed. And then uh, later on, the wooden boat building shop was moved all the way over to the uh, east side of the yard, uh, which is over um, today by Kent Avenue. Um, and that building was one of the buildings that after the turnover in 1966, it was torn down. So there's a lot of, you know, historic structures that were lost, um, you know, in the 1960s and 70s as the building, as the property was being turned over to the city and also being, um, you know, buildings just were not in a, a good state of repair. So, um, so we lost some of them uh, because of that. Um, but we still have Building 127. And it's really sort of in the core. You know, we call this the late 19th, early 20th century core of the Navy Yard, where we have this concentration of, of these brick buildings. Um, and like we said, this is one of the last ones to be renovated. Uh, but we have them back. OK, great. Uh, Doug, if you could just turn your turn your camera. There we go. And we will unmute you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for no, no worries. Thank you all for for holding, holding, just FYI, we are installing new and, antennas. And uh, just flip your camera around. There you go. We are installing new antennas here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, so I apologize <laughs> that, <laughs> that the connection is still spotty sometimes. But nonetheless, okay. I, hope, I hope that you guys have heard the part of uh, the conversation that we were having about the, the annex, which I find it a super fascinating space. We are so now... So we lost you right there when you started talking about the annex. So if you could just briefly tell us uh, yes, of a course. little bit about of the annex space. Of course, the annex is, uh, well, the annex is a street. The annex was, uh, I mean, it is still McDonough Street. In the early 20th century, the US Navy decided because they needed more space to cover it up. That is really the street between what used to be build, the original building 127 and building 22, which is the adjacent building that we have. So in the early, in the first part of the 20th century, the US Navy covered it up. And over time, it became an integral part of the building, of building 127, to the point that if you look now at the zoning maps, McDonald Street belongs to building 127. It's an interior space of the building. It's not a street anymore. And I find it extremely fascinating because it's really, I feel like that can happen just in New York City. Uh, moreover, though, as I was mentioning before, the annex at the entire building 127 is an historical register building. So even the cobblestones that we had in the annex, the curb that we have on the side, had, and we want, had to be preserved, and we wanted it to be preserved, preserved to keep the nature of the building intact. That is just an example of how these type of buildings, manufacturing buildings, brick buildings with big open structural span um, 
uh, open spaces can be flexible over time and change depending on the need of the user. So, so, but without further ado, now we are on the second floor. The second floor, you can still see the very similar to the first floor, the very high ceiling. Um, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a, as well a manufacturing, manufacturing floor, uh, like the first floor. What I wanted to show you here is uh, a good, this floor is good to show you how we found the building back in 2016, 2018, when we came in. You can see it here on the walls with a different color of paint. The building, as we got in in 2016, had six floors. The building originally was built in 1903 as a three stories building. But over time, the users are obviously trying to uh, take advantage of the high ceiling height, they decided to install mezzanines throughout the second floor, as well, the first floor, second floor, and third floor, creating effectively a six stories building. That was a major initial task that we undertook during our re rehabilitation in 2018, where we had and we wanted to demo this floor area to recreate the space as again, they were back in 1903. Um, so, Doug, uh, sorry, sorry, Andrew, one, one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you can go back one second to slide 13. Uh, um, so, slide 13 should show you now the floor plan of the second floor. One thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, that because of the high flood level here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and in Brooklyn, in this area in general, we decided to locate all the mechanical rooms in, at this level. The, the first floor and second floor mechanical rooms are all here. We have the fire pump room, electrical, electrical closet here that serves the entire building. Moreover, we're gonna undertake next, this year and next year another major project inside the building where we're gonna relocate the substation that is currently on the first floor and move it up to the second floor. As you know, and as you can imagine, back in 2012, because of Sandy, we had the major damages on the ground floor of this building. So now, after uh, coordinating with FEMA, we've been able to, to do the right thing and to move all the mechanical rooms above the flood, the, the flood plain. So this, this, the, the, the open floor plate, uh, of this build of this floor is perhaps slightly affected by this decision, but we do believe that it's the right decision for the long term of the building. And, and Rosario, will, will that open will that open up more space on the first floor as a result? That's correct. That's correct. The substation on the first floor um, is going to be demo, uh, demoed, and the space is was is going to be given to the current tenant of the first floor. So, yeah, so this is, this is an amazing space. Uh, real quick, I wanted to show you the floor, sorry, the roof of the annex, where always following the strategy of relocating all the mechanical rooms and equipment above the flood plain, we located all, our generator, our emergency generator here on the roof of the annex, as well all the chillers for the air conditioning. This was, uh, it seems easy to do, but obviously since the roof of the annex had been built as a temporary uh, structure in order to support the weight of uh, uh, this new mechanical equipment, we had to uh, install damaged steel from building 22, which is the building that you see in front of us, to building 127. We repaired the roof struct, the roof membrane of the annex, as well as, as we reinforced the structure of the light steel tr trusses underneath. It was, uh, it was a major scope. And as we look across uh, across this this, this quote-unquote street, uh, we can see that Building 22 has windows similar to what 
Building 127 had, they're, they're all covered over. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I mean, obviously, being an architect, I will never approve this decision, but I do understand that, again, for manufacturing purposes, it's much easier to work in front of a, or to use, uh, to put equipment in front of an opaque uh, 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 wall uh, rather than a window. And particularly because windows are obviously difficult to maintain uh, sometimes. But the windows that we installed here are, I think, uh, at the end, a successful example of what can happen when uh, uh, this type of rehabilitation projects uh, happen. What we see here, maybe, Andrew, we can go, sorry, uh, Doug, we can go over there where we have the biggest windows of the, of the building. So, and, and are, are, there, are there any plans to do a similar renovation for building 22? Actually, building 122, yes, is already under, uh, undergoing some renovation, renovations led mainly by the tenants. Inside, we have NYU, we have uh, other tenants that they are working in finishing up their, their renovation. I believe that they're gonna open up their facade, uh, the facade that we just saw to a certain degree, but I'm not 100% sure. It's, it's a project that we are overseeing, but it's the tenant, uh, right. are the tenants that are- And, and, the, the, and that's, the, uh, that's the NYU R Lab, which is their virtual reality uh, laboratory, right? Exactly, exactly, which we are super happy to have. It's going to be a, a very interesting space, innovative in terms of uh, study for sound and acoustics. So, Andrew, one thing that I wanted to show everyone is the size of these windows. As I mentioned earlier, here we are talking about a 12 feet by 70 feet, 17 feet tall window. All this is wood, as it was originally. Um, uh, it's uh, beautiful at the moment, it's just primed. The only big difference, and I hope that the tenants will appreciate it, is that the glass uh, is double pane and not a single pane as it used to be. We are trying to obviously do the right thing from an energy consumption point of view as well. And, and also from a sound perspective, right? Because you're right next to the uh, Navy Yard's cogeneration plant. That, so that, the, that, that, that's correct, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, so this is the second floor. Come with, come with us on the third floor, which is uh, amazing. It's the most iconic uh, space that we have here. While we're walking, I can show some before photos uh, from some of these floors. Uh, so I'll oh, show absolutely, slide, absolutely. slide 14. Perfect, yes. If, if you want to, you can also go to, I think, uh, slide 15 and 16. So yes, Andrew, I apologize, I should have told you. Basically, those are the pictures that we took back in 2018 that show the mezzanines on the second floor, which is absolutely crazy. Like it's, uh, Again, it's a, it was a, a pity that they built them. Yeah, uh, so we're, we're seeing that right now. They, so they, so the, these photos were taken shortly after Cumberland moved out, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And you can see there in the mezzanine that they had, they had their offices, their logistic spaces. It makes perfect sense from a manufacturing point of view. It's just that it, it, it definitely, when I saw that, when I saw the building back in 2018, I felt that there was a lost opportunity. And the, with the removal of the uh, mezzanines, the building was completely different from where, uh, for how we found it back in 2018. So, Andrew, if you don't mind, if you can go to slide uh, uh, 17. Slide 17, should be, you should now be able to see the floor plan of the third floor. So the third floor is the only floor that has a different designation from the first and second floor, which are manufacturing. This floor is an office space. So you can imagine desks, 
conference rooms, uh, uh, um, pantries, uh, people uh, working all together at their desks in this space. The potential is, is incredible. Uh, so yes, it's an office space, but just FYI, we recently signed the lease with uh, the Smart Design, a company that knows quite a lot about manufacturing since uh, they are able, I'm sure that everybody knows them. And if you don't know them, you most likely have some of the products inside your kitchen or your uh, cleaning supply uh, closet because they are able to take every day's uh, uh, objects, uh, see them in a, in a different light and reimagine them and make them better. So uh, we are very happy to have them. They, they just took half of this, this big space. Like if you um, want, we can go to this corner. Please, please, Andrew. Rosario, I, I, above your head, I think, is one of the most interesting features of, yes. of the building. So maybe we can take a look at that. Yes, absolutely. So, um, uh, Andrew, if you want, you can go to slide 18, 19, and 20. You should be able now to see the third floor as it was back in the first part of the 20th century. And you can see the cranes that Andrew uh, pointed out at, which we have right above us. These are just a few of them. Reading the pictures that you probably are seeing now on your screen, you see that there were so many more uh, cranes that really helped out uh, um, the workers moving those big ships that came here for repair. What we have here Right, uh, this, this door is actually a window, but is a, is a door window that used to open so that through a stereo cranes, the ships could, go, could be lifted and brought inside the, 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 the third floor. We have the same window right below this one on the second floor. And that was the purpose of these two windows. If you have noticed, and we can look at them later on, from the exterior, you see that these two windows look different from the others. But they look different, first of all, because well, they, they were like this back in 1903, and because they had a very important function in bringing in and out uh, goods into this uh, uh, big manufacturing space. So, uh, so, so just so we're clear, there used to be, a, a, in addition to that, the crane that moves lateral or you know lengthwise of the building, there was also a hoist that went outside the building as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. And you find these cranes on the second floor as well, right? Yes, we have them on every floor, and like the cobblestones that we had at the annex, those are historical elements that we could not touch. And obviously we didn't want to touch them because they are, they are representing the history of the, of the building perfectly. Uh, they are not in working condition. We removed the electrical um, uh, connections during our, our rehabilitation projects. You see now that there are some ductworks in the way, life fixer in the way. So, uh, let's not plan to move them anytime soon, but they are absolutely beautiful. And uh, again, they are representative of how the building used to be uh, when it was built. Uh, so, uh, Doug, uh, Andrew, am I yet directed you to the wrong slide earlier on? Slide but that's, a, that's okay. I, I have the, uh, so I have the slides up now so we can see the, the hoists, um, Perfect, some exactly. of, portions Hoist. of which are, are still in place. Uh, on the side of the building, which you can see all the way on your right. Um, so we have, we have 1903, the 1980s and current uh, uh, on this slide, so. Exactly, exactly. And it, the slide before shows the third floor as it was, as yeah. it was back in the 20th century. Uh, slide 18, 19 and 20 show the building, sorry, show the third floor as it was back in 2018. Yes, and yes, the intervention. The intervention here was the same of the other floors. We had to remove the uh, big mezzanines. We had to open up again all the windows. We also had to uh, repour a big portion of the slab, uh, the one that we have here on the right, because it was in terrible condition. This is just, I mean, this is the topping slab. It's not a completely 
news lab, but it was definitely a major undertaker for our rehabilitation project. New, as you can see right below the windows, that we have new heating system. This is hydraulic. We have steam. The Brooklyn Aviard is famous and the Cogen is famous because uh, of the, it generates a steam for the whole Brooklyn Aviard and much more. Um, so the, the building has a steam line and then uh, heating is generated inside the building and, and through, through hydraulic. Uh, 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 fins uh, here installed at every uh, window bay. So you can see that we here, in terms of uh, roof and ceiling, and it's perfect, Doug is showing you now the underside of the ceiling, we didn't do much there. And actually, I think we kept it uh, as it was originally in 1903. Uh, First of all, we didn't want, again, to change the, um, the, the original vision of the building. The, uh, obviously, the roof has been uh, replaced many times, the membrane above, uh, but the underside, we felt that it was uh, beautiful as is. And I feel like that our tenants and our potential tenants are seeing it in the same way. Uh, you can see the major lightweight uh, uh, trusses spanning throughout the, 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 the space. And the ceiling height at the uh, apex goes up to 50 feet here. It's, uh, it's an amazing space. Uh, uh, there is uh, the space that really pushed us all to undertake this uh, rehabilitation project in such a short uh, time. So I think uh, at this point, I mean, I pretty much finished my, my presentation. I just wanted to say that as many projects, uh, this project has been uh, a challenge. Uh, when you reinvent something new is always a challenge. Again, every part of uh, this big engine, every little gear worked uh, uh, well all together in order to achieve uh, this common goal of bringing back to life uh, this building. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's, you can see me now without mask, which is so unusual in these days, but let's not forget that we had to also finish up this project during COVID, during the pandemic that affected everybody so much. Uh, if you remember about last year, this time in March, April, we, uh, the, the governor had uh, issued an executive order to stop uh, all construction, uh, to have the city pretty, pretty much in a uh, complete lockdown. And, uh, but because of what we are, because of the mission that we, 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 we are pursuing, because of the fact that, that the Brooklyn Navy Yard was at the time producing PPE material, we were able to continue the, 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 the construction during those tough time. So it was even more difficult than any other project that we were able to uh, uh, undertake uh, um, uh, normally just because of the uh, exceptional conditions uh, that we had back in 2020. Nonetheless, everybody, DOB, all the public agencies included worked with us in trying to finish up as soon as possible. And that was, uh, that was, that was incre incredible. And I just want to, again, thank everybody for uh, working together towards uh, this, this common goal. Yeah, Ro Rosario, thank you. And we have lots of questions from the audience. So, so stick around, everybody. Um, sure. But, but thank you for, for showing us around. I had a question since you were um, uh, just talking uh, about the, the roof. Um, which is maybe we can take a peek, but the, the roof, um, I don't know if we can see it on Zoom, but you know, every square inch of that roof has nails coming through it. <laughs> so um, can you tell us a yeah. little bit about, because uh, you said you left the roof largely, largely untouched. Um, but uh, yeah, what can you tell us a little Absolutely. bit about the, the construction of it and you know, yes, keeping that kind of not only the structure, but the aesthetic? Absolutely. I mean, I, I admit that the intervention had the litter at the roof, so I'm not sure exactly what the composition of the roof itself is. What I can tell you 
my assumption is that they used the wrong nails. <laughs> so they had mm -hmm. longer, longer nails that the body was really needed to, to go through the, through the assembly of the roof. Um, I'm assuming back in, in, in the 20th century, I'm assuming that that was the uh, purlins, the underside of uh, uh, the, 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 the roof, that those uh, small uh, planks uh, run in between the second, secondary steel structure. And underneath, uh, we may have uh, probably a two inches, two and a half inches uh, uh, layer of uh, butt insulation, and then uh, another layer of plywood uh, nailed underneath. So the top layer of the of, of the of, of the roof is literally nailed through this uh, assembly into the purlins of uh, of the roof, which is basically what we see here. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention about the roof is uh, to mention what we didn't do. If you, if you look well, right above me, we have skylights. The skylights have been covered up, I believe, in early 80s by Cumberland in order to preserve, to maintain the building. The building at that point was in bad shape. It had been abandoned for a few years after the US Navy left. Uh, so the roof uh, was not in great condition. So Cumberland and the, the, the Navy Yard undertook this renovation of the roof, applying a new membrane above uh, the skylights, which we, Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, we are maintaining regularly every 10, 15 years. Uh, we have a standing warranty until 2027. Um, uh, and so we decided not to reopen the, the skylights uh, uh, um, just because the roof was already in good condition and we just decided not to take the risk. As mm -hmm. everybody knows, skylights can leak, uh, do leak, and so we decided to not uh, uh, embrace that task uh, uh, in our rehabilitation project. That said, I mean, it was well known by MPS, by the historical uh, district, and was accepted as a, uh, a decision that we, that we made. Uh, we have another question here from, from your colleague, uh, John Coburn, and he asks, uh, what was the most difficult or challenging part of the project? Well, <laughs> hi, John. Uh, uh, so well, there there are there are may, there have been many uh, uh, difficult parts. But like any any other project, I don't complain. It's like it's normal. It would not be fun if everything was going to go uh, easy uh, all the time. Um, definitely, COVID was a big surprise. But uh, the major, the biggest problem that we had was the procurement of the windows, as we. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, uh, there are very few manufacturers able to restore this type of windows and uh, recreate uh, this type of windows and install them as well. Something that I didn't mention earlier, the windows that we have uh, downstairs between the annex on the ground floor, between the annex and the, the main space of the ground floor were original. We took them and we, we restored sash after sash, all the windows, uh, uh, it was a, a never ending task. And that was perhaps the problem is that we were under a very aggressive schedule and the time that our manufacturer took to uh, uh, restore those windows was, uh, has been a, a bit too long. So we had to adjust the schedule accordingly, eating up uh, uh, um, on other tasks that we, we could have uh, taken a bit longer to, 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 to undertake. These windows here instead are completely new. These have been built piece by piece by the same manufacturer. And you can see that is, uh, again, there's only primed now. We hope that the tenants will take care of the actual painting to preserve the beauty and the integrity of the, the windows per se but they are completely new. And again, they've been approved by, approved by MPS as an historical 
part of the of the of, of the building. We had to look up in order to get to these windows since since they were not there anymore, we had to look up all the various drawings that the US Navy had left of, left us of the building and work with both S9 architecture and the, 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 the manufacturer in order to recreate them uh, with a look as close as possible to, to the original. Um, so the, the windows, yes, were diff yeah. definitely a difficult one. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we also had some questions about tenants. Um, so, so first, you mentioned a, a couple tenants that are already signed up to move into the building on the first and the third floor. Um, right. Is there anyone who's going to be moving into the second floor as of yet? As of now, no. Is uh, I believe that is uh, is still uh, vacant. Although we are receiving a lot of interest for the second floor, uh, I know I found out just today, and probably. Uh, maybe Andrew or Carly knows more about it. We are having events uh, uh, related to BAM uh, um, here in Brooklyn, the, the, the Academy of Music here, uh, here in Brooklyn, events uh, that they are taking place on the second floor, which is currently the only vacant space uh, here inside the building. Um, yes, Sydney and I actually... The uh, we attended one of the 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 one on one concerts last Saturday, so they're they're happening this weekend too. It's it's literally one on one, yeah. one audience member, one musician uh, in a space in the Navy Yard. Really amazing. It's it's it's, it's an amazing idea, and actually that, that space is perfect for that uh, that type of uh, uh, events because the the acoustic is, is 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 amazing because of the high ceilings and so forth. I just also wanted to, to mention though, that, that that portion of the third floor, I don't, I don't want to start advertising it, but it's vacant. So <laughs> <laughs> Smart Design is taking half of it. We're going to have a demising wall that we're going to start the construction of very soon. But the, all, the whole west side of the third floor is still vacant. And so, so one thing that I wanted to iterate one more time is really how I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky to be here, but I'm just one of the many, like there are so many projects that happened before and that are going to happen after because of what we did uh, back in 2018 and 2020 here in this, pro in, in this inside this building. Um, and speaking of tenants, we also had a question about, um, you know, the process of, of tenants moving in and, and doing the build out. And, you know, does the Navy Yard do any of the build out or is that all the tenants uh, who do that? Uh, like when you're subdividing a space like this? Yes, of course. Uh, it, the the, the uh, easy answer, although I know it's a, it's a tough one, is it depends. Very often we are having portions of the build out that we uh, manage. And, 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 and sometimes we have... Uh, uh, the tenant designing and managing their build out by, by themselves. For example, we know that the tenants that we have now inside the building are keen to do some modifications to the elevators. Something that I should have mentioned earlier, we obviously re completely renovate, renovated the elevators and the elevators course of the building. We have two elevators, well, one on the west side, east side, one on the west side, so one of the tasks that my team will take, take care of will be to open up new uh, end entrances or openings, uh, doors of the elevators for the west elevator. Another part of the uh, uh, tenants fit out that we will take care of will be to manage the, the, the installation of the, the demising walls between tenant and tenant. Generally speaking though, unless uh, the tenant ask us to, we let the tenant manage their own uh, build out at their own pace. Uh, and we just uh, over, over, oversight the whole process, obviously being available uh, anytime if, uh, if questions comes up. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas had a question about the, the heating. Uh, does this building still use this, the steam uh, radiators or has that they've been refurbished? They've been refurbished in a way that we have steam coming, out, coming in into the building. We have then uh, the steam, uh, I'm, I'm an architect, so I'm sorry for all the mechanical engineers that are gonna hear this, but uh, the steam into the pump room 
uh, heats up water, and then the hot water runs into these hydraulic uh, uh, radiators that we have underneath, uh, in front of us, uh, underneath the windows. We have one radiator every window, and is uh, we believe uh, doing uh, the mechanical calculations uh, that they are uh, more than sufficient uh, to 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 provide the heating into the space. Nonetheless, something I wanted to highlight is that we also give air handling units to the tenant. To the tenant, the tenants will build their own ductwork system, but uh, the uh, two rooms that are behind the dug at this very moment are the uh, rooms where the hair rendering units are. And these hair rendering units, depending on the decision of the, of the, of the uh, tenant, can provide both uh, cooling or heating into the, into the space. Yeah, and just, uh, just to, to clarify for folks again, that, that steam is coming from, from right next door, the Brooklyn cogeneration plant, which uh, provides electricity as, as, well as, as well as steam. And so, yeah, if uh, Zoom does a really good job of filtering it out, but when we were outside, you know, you can hear that steam rushing through these giant pipes and, and uh, we can now see the, uh, the, the, the stack of the power plant right there. Um, well, th this has been so great, Rosario. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time. Oh, great. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to show us around. And I think this was a, a really fantastic way to not only introduce this project, but you know, introduce the, the Navy Yard and the mission and all the work that's done to really be stewards of this incredible um, you know, historic site uh, and turn it into something useful for, for the people of New York and, and creating uh, good quality jobs. So, so thank you for your presentation, but also thank you for all the work that you and, and the whole team at, at BNYDC does. So Thanks so thank much. You so much. Um, thank well, you. great. So uh, again, folks, thank you for joining us. Thanks for all of your wonderful questions. Um, we dropped a number of resources into the chat. If you want to find out more, if you want to come and visit um, the Navy Yard, uh, as we mentioned, we will be kicking off uh, our tours again in, in the coming weeks, uh, starting off with our bicycle tours. Um, but there's lots of ways that you can come and engage uh, with the yard, visit the uh, um, food manufacturing hub at building 77, uh, get a beer, get some bagels. Um, but you can also uh, visit the uh, Naval Cemetery landscape over on the Williamsburg side of the yard, visit Kings County Distillery, uh, and also visit the wonderful public art exhibition that's on display right now called Atmosphere for Invention. And, and last week we did uh, a, a virtual open studios with the artists. Um, so you can uh, check that out on our website. Uh, so enjoy the rest of NYC by Design Week uh, and check out our next program, which is going to be in three hours, uh, where we're going to go down to Sunset Park and check out the Bush Terminal uh, Made in New York uh, campus. Uh, also, we'll be live on the scene at the construction site. Um, so again, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of NYC by Design Week. Thanks so much. <laughs>